Sometimes the best stories in golf aren't found on tour. You'll find them at the back of the range. And here's your host, Ben Adelberg. And thanks again for joining me here at the back of the range. I'm your host, Ben Adelberg. This is episode 43. Well, I'm headed out of town again for a couple of days to play a little golf. But before we do that, we have another great episode here at the podcast. Where am I going? Well, actually going to go play in the Florida Cup. It's a Ryder Cup style event hosted by the Florida State Golf Association, which pits top amateurs from North Florida against top amateurs from South Florida. It'll be held at the Creek Course at Hammock Dunes in Palm Coast, Florida. I'll try to do my best to post some pictures and videos while I'm up there. If you're following us on Instagram, you'll see some familiar faces from our podcast from earlier in the year. Chip Brook, Mark Dahl, Scott Kennedy, Steve Carter, they're all participating in the Florida Cup. They were all previous guests on the podcast. Before we get to this week's episode, let's get some of the housekeeping stuff out of the way. As I said, we're on Instagram. We're there at the Back of the Range podcast. Don't forget, we're also on Facebook and Twitter. All the links that you need are in the show notes of this episode of the podcast. And if you want to listen to episodes featuring guests that are participating in the Florida Cup or any of our previous episodes, head on over to thebackoftherange.com. Everything you need is right there. Also, we have towels, hats, drink koozies, lots of items with our logo all over them. We want to give them away. So leave a review in Apple Podcasts, make some comments on our social media channels, and you never know, might just send something out to you. So earlier this year, we welcomed Coach Alan Bratton to the Back of the Range Golf Podcast. If that name sounds familiar, it should. He led the Oklahoma State Cowboys to a dominant performance in the national championship last year. Well, this week's guest is Laura Ionello. She's the head coach of the national champion Arizona Wildcats women's golf team. For as dominant as Oklahoma State's win was, well, Arizona's was as probably as dramatic as you can possibly imagine. Remember, the NCAA changed the format in the national championship in 2015. Stroke play format to start, and then the low eight teams qualify for match play. Guess what seed Arizona earned? Yep, eighth. You'll hear the entire story of the championship from Coach Ainello later in the episode. We're also going to get into her playing career at Arizona. She uh, played a little golf with ladies like Baena, Gulbis, and Ochoa. She won a national championship. She runnered up in the U.S. Women's Am in 2000 and played in three U.S. Opens. We also discussed her recruiting strategy at Arizona and her affinity for golf dorks. We'll explain later. So let's get started with this week's episode. Coach, you're at the back of the range. Thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. No, not a problem. National championship coach. We uh, we had Alan Bratton on earlier this year. Now we have had the, both the, the, the men's and the women's national championship coach. Does it ever get old when you hear that uh, next to your name, national championship coach? Not at all. It is what we do this for. Uh, we do this to win championships, and I, I finally got my first, and it feels pretty good. That's great. That's great. Well, we're going to get into the the magical, uh, gosh, the, the crazy national championship that you guys won last year. We're going to get into that, but we always start these episodes off, try and give a little bit of background to the listeners of how our guests actually got into the game of golf. So, population 23,486, Charleston, Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me how you got into golf in Charleston, Illinois. Uh, I'm, it's a very small rural country town, and I'm very fortunate where I have uh, a country club, pretty much one golf course in the area. Charleston Country Club is where I grew up, and they had a, a head pro who was a fantastic instructor, Mike Monsell, who's actually the, um, the head coach at Eastern Illinois University for both the men's and women's program. Oh, great. Was, uh, started taking, I started going out with my dad probably at the age of, you know, five, six and started taking lessons at the age nine. And that was it for me. I had the bug. I loved it. So you, you play as a junior, you're playing in Illinois. Uh, I'm assuming you play in high school that gets your, that gets you noticed that gets you to play at the university of Arizona. I mean, you're not only the coach now, but you have really just gone up the, the ranks from being a player to an assistant to the head coach in, in 2010. So what was the culture shock what was your ability to adapt from Charleston, Illinois to a college town of Tucson, Arizona? 
you know, I, I, from the moment that I knew I wanted to play professional golf and I wanted to play collegiate golf, I wanted to go to warm weather. And I, I don't know why I always had this infatuation with the West Coast. So, of course, I, I was wanting to go to schools like UCLA and USC or, sure. you know, um, Arizona, Arizona State, all the schools, too, that I had known had been very successful in collegiate golf. So, I don't know. It just I wasn't scared to go away from home. And I'm very fortunate where I my freshman year at the university of Arizona, once I decided to come to the U of a, that my parents bought a little winter home and they, they spend the winters here and uh, they fell in love with Tucson, Arizona, just as much as I did. So really it was just a situation where I wanted to go to a school that I knew would prep me for professional golf and having players such as, you know, Annika Sorenstam, Lita Lindley, Chris Johnson at the time back in, you know, 1998, when I went to school, like those were the names you kind of knew, Marissa Baena. And so I just, I knew that if I wanted to reach my goals of professional golf, Arizona would be a great place. And so that's why I decided at U of A. Yeah. So you're, you spend your collegiate career playing at the University of Arizona, and we're going to get into uh, all of the great accomplishments that you've had as the coach. But I had to at least hit on some uh, of some of the highlights of your playing career. Now, before you turn professional, I did a little bit of digging uh, here and <laughs> runner up at the 2000 U.S. Women's Amateur. And I see that some some Laura Myerskoff defeated a teammate, and I think it's L- Lorena Ochoa. You beat Lorena Ochoa in 19 holes in the quarterfinals. Do you, does your team know this? Uh, maybe. I don't I don't know if they do, actually. Oh, you got to be kidding me. They don't know you took down Ochoa <laughs> in the USAM? I mean, come on. I d- I don't think they do. We went to 19 holes. It was it was intense. And the crazy thing about that match was uh, Lorena was going to be an incoming freshman. So here I beat her at the AM and I thought she was going to hate me. Right. You know, but that's the coolest thing about Lorena Choa is she's the sweetest, most humble, uh, kind kind person that you could ever meet so she didn't hold it against me when she joined our team that fall <laughs> it's like laura meet lorena yeah yeah we've met yeah, we, we, <laughs> yeah, yeah i know who laura is yeah great yeah yeah um so so you're you make it to the runner-up of the u.s women's and um, you played in three uh three women's opens you know you just actually mentioned that it actually brings up a question we're going to get to this but you just said you had a great relationship with lorena ochoa even after beating her before she comes in to play on the team when you're coaching your ladies now, how do you develop a relationship or a team culture where you want them to compete against each other? They want to get into those top five spots so they can travel and be a starter. So how do you get the competition going, but also teach them how to support each other no matter what? Well, one of the most important things that I've learned, I think, in the last nine years of being a head coach is making sure that the ladies on the team know each other off the golf course, that they respect each other in other regards to their golf game, you know, knowing that maybe one player came from a family, you know, of Christian values, maybe one where they were Buddhist or, or just, just, and be honest with you, no, did you grow up at a private club? Did you practice at public courses? Just, do you have siblings? Little things just to get to know one another helps immensely to get these young women to respect one another, to be kind and polite to one another, to know each other besides just the golf course. Because if you only focus on the golf, it it doesn't lead to a very cohesive team. Everybody, you know, doesn't really get along. So I feel like the better you can get these young women to know more about each other in their personal lives really has always seemed to help. And that's my experience. So they're looking more as their teammates as people instead of just someone in front of them on the pecking order to get into the starting role. Yes, totally. Absolutely. Well, you've had tremendous success on the team. Now, before you got into coaching, which I'm assuming is got to be your dream job right about now, being the national champion, but before you got into coaching, you played professionally. Um, what was your worst job in, that you've ever had in golf? This is your dream <laughs> job. What was the worst job? We've all had those jobs. What was your worst uh... job in golf? Well, I worked as a golf shop attendant when I was playing professionally in between the Symmetra Tour and the LPGA. And I remember I worked in a golf shop and I gave I gave lessons, um, kind of like an assistant pro sure. at the Phoenician in Phoenix. And I remember hating to be in a golf shop. I remember hate standing around in a golf shop. I remember I wanted to be out 
playing or giving lessons or giving playing lessons, you name it. I just wanted to be outside, sure. I guess. So that would probably be my my worst job. But then, you know, I was a I was a player who I thought I wanted to play professional golf. I thought it was my dream. And then the moment that I actually made it on tour, I realized it wasn't what I wanted. The lifestyle on the LPJ tour and Symmetra Tour was was very lonely, isolated. You know, your your play pretty much represented your worth right. and I didn't handle that very well. And so something that I thought was my dream job, such as playing professionally, wasn't my dream job, but you learn that as you go. And coaching was a perfect fit because I understand these young women are going to have these goals to play professionally and it's great. And I think everyone that dreams about playing professionally should uh, really pursue that dream, but let them know that that, does not that's not their value as a person that if they decide that they play pro and they don't love it and they don't want to do it that that does not mean that they're a less of a person you know so and to strive to do more while they are in college if it's study business or go into pre-med you know really make sure they have other avenues like I did because I I thought my whole life was going to be playing a professional golfer right. and I didn't but luckily I studied a secondary education with a coaching minor in school. It was a perfect avenue for me to go right into coaching. So, so that's interesting that, that you mentioned that because you, you say how it's the perfect avenue. Can you pinpoint one moment where you realize that, okay, coaching's my thing. Was there one moment like a connection with a player or, or maybe as when you were a, an assistant at Arizona, do you remember the time when it's like, okay, this is, this is where I want to be. I mean, I just, I just, I just remember coming off of my student teaching, playing professionally and being in the office, talking with recruits about why coming to the university of Arizona is so special. And it's such a great place. I think that's when I knew my calling. I was like, I get to help these young women, these high school prospects choose which university they're going to go to. And I can get to help them live through me, I can tell them how wonderful my experience was at the University of Arizona and sure. how they would also have the same experience. So it's kind of almost like a giving back, you know, giving giving back to golf by helping other young women and just being at practice with the team. I just loved it from day one. Sure, sure. Well, and you, you talk about recruiting. Um, I, it's the, the Pac-12 has got to be just, I mean, that is the conference in ladies golf right now. I mean, just you, you've, the Pac-12 has won the last four national championships since you went to match play. You have, mm -hmm. I mean, you have, you, you know, Stanford, Washington, uh, Arizona State, you know, the, those people. And then, you know, Arizona. Um, what is your recruiting process? What's your philosophy? Can you just briefly describe how you go after players and what your mindset is? Right, right. Well, to be honest with you, since we are in some, uh, such a competitive um, atmosphere against other Pac-12 schools, you know, it's Arizona is a wonderful educational institution. We're a research institution. Not many people know how great of a school we are. And so I really try to sell that. I try to sell it to my recruits that you're not going to come to U of A and just, you know, study some ho-hum degree, you're actually going to be preparing for your future also along with professional golf. So it's, you know, my recruiting tactic is just more so do you want to try to pursue both dreams of earning a degree, become a, becoming a professional golfer, or also becoming a professional in whatever avenue that you want, like business, medicine, law, architecture, engineering, you know, so, and to be honest with you, I, I have to, at the level that we're at, I have to recruit the best players, hands down. Of course. You have to be the best. And so sadly, if you're not one of the best, and if you also don't have strong academics, you know, I probably am not going to look, look at you as highly, but we are always competing against not just the Pac-12, but, oh, you know, course. Texas, and Oklahoma State, Alabama. They're also going after those top prospects. So it's insanely competitive, but that's what also what makes it fun. Oh, of course. And well, I'd imagine too, it, it makes the pool that all of you are kind of pulling out of a little bit, uh, you know, smaller because there's a certain level where like, if you, you can't perform on the course, I mean, I'm really sorry, but it's just, you know, you're not going to be the, you know, you're not going after those players. What are the characteristics? And, you know, I, I'm around a lot of junior golfers down here in South Florida. Uh, I bump into a lot of parents by playing uh, in, in Florida State Golf Association events. And, mm -hmm. you know, I see some of the good things, some of the things that are a little bit questionable, but what are some of the characteristics and personality traits that, 
you look for, if you had two players side by side with the same scores and the same GPA, what are some of the characteristics and personality traits that you look after that you look for? You know, one of my biggest things is being polite and kind. And so not just the interaction that I might have with that student athlete prospect, but how are they with their parents? How are they with their, their peers on the golf course? And I think, you know, perfect example in our day and age, we as coaches have this beautiful new tool called social media. And so (laughs) that's, you know, and you, as coaches, we can learn a lot about a prospect through Instagram, Facebook, um, Twitter, you know, you can really kind of see through the lines of what type of person they are, you know, and my, my thing that I love about a prospect more than anything is I, I want a player that loves the game of golf. I want, I want fans of golf. I don't want just someone who wants to be a professional or play at the best level, but I want someone that loves golf, like loves competition, loves watching the LPGA scores, watch, loves watching Tiger Woods win at the East Lake and and talk about it in my office. You know, I love, I love lovers of the game. And so I, I really look for that on social media. And if, if you are, you know, do you love the process? Do you love, you know, I love kids that are posting their hard work with their instructors or if they're practicing, you know, other, other than maybe other social avenues. I think it's great to have a broad spectrum where they, you know, they, they have fun and they have other activities or if it's, they play other sports. I think those are all great things, but then there's also things that I try to steer clear of recruits, you know, when they're maybe not into the best things, if they're always posting pictures of partying or, you know, going out, little stuff like that. I hate parties. They're terrible. Um, So (laughs) no, Uh, but, but so what you're saying, and, and I'm going to, you know, I mean this in the nicest way, you want golf doors. Like me, you want you yes. want you want golf dorks. I do. There totally. you go. See, and you can use it as a tagline for any of your recruiting <laughs> material if you need that, or you know. But that's, I mean, that's perfect. No, I think ever, I think I think it's that that's fantastic. So, um, you mentioned about your players that you want them, you know, if they want to go turn pro. Um, you know, before we talk about your your national championship season, which had a lot of challenges, I, I realized early on. You know, mm-hmm. one of your players left uh, mid-season around the holidays to turn professional. So you're, you know, you want to have this incredible sense of pride to send off your seniors with a degree and and have them play all four or five years, depending on their 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 eligibility. But how do you balance the communication with them when they're thinking about turning professional early? Yeah, you know, it's it's probably one of the most difficult parts of the job, especially with our seniors, because you want them to know that you want success for them and that you're always wishing them well and you're trying to push them towards being successful, but you also want them to stay and graduate and, and help the team till the very last minute, you know, perfect. You know, last year was a, a, a very special situation where we had kind of been told that the player was coming back and then I got a text message on Christmas day saying she was turning pro. Oh, that's So that was, it was a (laughs) dev. No, last year was, if you would have talked to me like, December 26th last year, I was devastated. I mean, I did my, my world had been turned upside down because I, the team that I thought would have been the national championship team was not in my mind anymore. I was like, Oh, we're, you know, but that just shows you right there, the resiliency of these kids and how they can push through. Um, Because really her turning pro really devastated the whole team, even though they wished her well and wanted good things for her. They were really devastated that she abandoned us um, putting it in the spot. But, but again, the players rose above it and really showed you how they, they fought through the adversity, you know, and I've got, I've got a player right now, Gigi Stoll, who's um, at LPJQ school. You know, she, I think saw how heartbreaking it was for our team to go through that and having lost that person mid year that, you know, I think just having open communication, knowing that I want what's best for her, but also I respect the decision that if she feels that's best for her to turn pro, that that as long as you communicate with me and let me know what you're thinking at all times or where you're, you know, if you are thinking about turning pro, if you're not, or what's the situation, like I'm okay with it because at the end of the day, I do want what's best for you. And I love you. You're my player. You've given this program so many great things. Well, very well said. Obviously open communication is important um, when you're building any team. So Let's uh, let's go ahead and pivot over to the national championship from last year. We all remember the the climactic end. Uh, you know, Haley Moore winning uh, with with the winning putt. But like you said, you know, basically you just led right into to my question regarding 
the beginning mm-hmm. of this season. So, you know, the first half, you're, I, I believe you're well outside the top 25 at the end of the fall season. You lose a player to go to the professional ranks. You just told mm-hmm. me, you just told me what the lowest point of the year was. It was the day after Christmas. <laughs> um, I know you said the kids are resilient and they put it together and they got back on the right track, but what was your first meeting like with the kids with the, with the, not the kids, but how was your first meeting with your young ladies on this team the first day back on campus after the holiday break? Well, after the holiday break, we were very fortunate that we had a mid-year ad, uh, Yu Sung Ho, and Yu Sung was from Taiwan right. and little little freshman in the dorm, and the fact that we had lost Crystal was devastating. But here we got to welcome this new wonderful young lady, and the one thing about Yu Sung was Yu Sung brings joy to everyone. She is just one of the nicest human beings you could ever meet. She was so excited to be a part of the team. Uh, she was kind to everyone. And so really the fact that Yu Song had joined our team last January kind of helped uh, take away the sting gotcha. of losing Crystal. And so, you know, really I think the ladies saw that this new member this new member actually helped team chemistry even more because all of a sudden the ladies got along a little bit better and, you know, just, I don't know exactly what it was, but it was more so just like a new team. So you, you turn the page, start in the spring, you get yourself to regionals, you get yourself to the national championship. And for, for those listeners that maybe aren't, 100% aware of how the national championship is conducted. They did make a change in 2015. So make sure I understand, make sure I'm correct here. You play 72 holes of stroke play and then the Mm -hmm. top eight uh, with their stroke play, obviously college golf, five players, four scores count each round, but the top eight teams then would advance to match play. So Mm -hmm. the day that you get into you do make the number eight seed. You get in on basically the very barely. Yeah, 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 yeah. So <laughs> I love. I mean, I, I was by the way, I was watching this live. I watched the. I, I watched this live. So the last hole, you have uh, one of your your stars, Bianca Pagdanganan, mm-hmm. and she um, she basically makes a thirty footer for eagle that gets you into a playoff for the eighth spot. So yes, we've seen the putt. Um, many times on the golf channel, where were you when the putt went in? Were, were you at 18? Was she the anchor match? Was she the last match on the course? Yeah. Bianca was kind of in the running for the medalist for, um, the NCAA championship and she got off to a rocky start. So I walked and was with Bianca pretty much from hole eight all the way to 18. Okay. Um, Bianca really struggled her first couple holes. Cause we were, we were with Haley and Gigi and a couple other girls that were struggling so bad that fourth round. And we kind of, I, I wish I would have gotten back to Bianca sooner. Cause I thought, you know, she probably maybe could have won the tournament if we would have helped her a little bit more early, but other way, um, B, B I was with Bianca on the 18th green, uh, when she made that Eagle putt. And I, I knew she might have a chance to win the tournament individually if she made it, but I, I knew also that if she made it for the team, like we would have a chance to be in the final eight. But right. again, the whole time I'm talking with Bianca, we're just more focusing, staying in the present. And more than anything, I think Bianca was kind of focused not just on the team, but just trying to play her best to maybe win the NCAA individual title. Sure. So it was, um, it was a lot of fun walking with her. She played absolutely amazing. And, you know, her dad had sent uh, me a prayer over Facebook in that morning. And the prayer, I shared that prayer with Bianca when we got to the golf course. I wasn't for sure if I should because I didn't want to put too much pressure on her. But right, right. it was this amazing prayer talking about how her good deeds will help others and that she should be calm on the golf course and confident and just know that. Um, Christ is with her and that by her playing well that day, it's going to bring joy to others. Oh my God. And this, this, no, this prayer was insane. I mean, it was, I mean, it still to this day brings me to tears even thinking about it. 
And, um, and then for her to make an eagle putt on the last hole to give our team a chance at the eighth spot, it was just divine. It really was. It was just amazing. That's a great story. Did not, did not know that. I mean, I, I obviously saw the putt in, uh, the putt go in and I just was like, you gotta be kidding me. How, I mean, that's just. After she made that putt, after that, after Bianca made that putt, she came running to me and I was, I was already bawling, crying. Sure. I, I was, and if you look at it on the video, I'm like shaking like a leaf. And all I keep saying to her is, I can't believe you made that. I can't believe you made that. It was almost like a miracle. It was a gift. It really was. It was pretty cool. Well, and you take that gift. So, and the, the thing that's so, <laughs> that's, that's so wild is that you, you take that incredible high and then you got to hold it together for the playoff and you get, you get through the playoff Baylor, if I remember correctly. Mm-hmm. So you get through Baylor yep. and then. You have to knock off um, UCLA and Stanford in the quarters and the semis, so you get mm-hmm. through you get through them, and then of course Alabama in the finals. How do I, I know they're young ladies, they're great athletes, but that's just a ton of golf in in just a, a two day <laughs> span. I mean, are you guys even seeing straight at that point? Like nothing, per, and you can't prepare for that. It's not like you can just. Right. I mean, how do you hold that together? Like you got to give me a story about someone that's just either has no food in their stomach and they just can't even see straight anymore. I mean, how bad was it? You know, that's the craziest thing is at Karsten Creek to my players all take push carts sure. and the zoysia grass at Karsten Creek is so squishy that it was more difficult to push a push cart on those fairways. So not only were we exhausted, but my players carried their bags instead of taking a push cart because the, the fairways were so miserable pushing a cart through. So right. at, at that point, by the time Stanford match was rough, it just kept re- like reminding them, stay hydrated, get some food in your belly, like just get off your feet as much as you can. Uh, Haley struggled a little bit with like, she had some knee issues, but you know, the one thing that my team never complained, not once did I hear any of them say, Oh, I'm so tired. It was pure adrenaline. Adrenaline pushed them through because just the fact that we were in that championship match, like they even every little soreness that they felt they they couldn't feel it i feel because they they were so excited and so jazzed about the opportunity to be in that final match that they i really cannot remember even one of them complaining that they were tired or that their feet or their back hurt or anything so it just I think when you get in that moment, that's sure. when your adrenaline kicks up and you just go. All right. Really? So, well, okay. So, so we're going to get back to a couple things there, but you said that they were flying on pure adrenaline all the way through after you win mm-hmm. and you got to get on a flight home. How <laughs> bad was everyone beat up on the flight back? No, everybody was still so pumped up. We, we finished the national championship. We won. All of us stayed up in the lobby at the hotel, like watching the replay oh, on gosh. TV. Oh, until like three in the morning, we went to McDonald's. I think a couple of the girls took Ubers to McDonald's, got food like three in the morning. And then, um, now, wait a minute. I, thought, I, thought, I, I thought you weren't recruiting partiers. I thought you wanted golf courts. I mean, what, this is wild. <laughs> well, Mc, McDonald's, Mc, and McDonald's, Uber? Is, McDonald's is not considered partying. I got like, milkshakes a little different. <laughs> Whoa. Milkshakes. This is, this is a milk, a milkshake and a Big Mac. A little different than uh, Buffalo Wild Wings. Right? Okay, so, gotcha. And then we, I think we had like a eleven o'clock flight out of uh, out of Oklahoma City. Still, and then we had this huge welcome back event right when we got into town. Like we had this police escort to the McHale Center, which was amazing. I did not feel tired until the very next day after we got home. And I literally felt like I couldn't get out of bed for right. three days. Right, right. Yeah, no, I, that's what I was kind of going for. I figured your kids, at some point, the tank, unfortunately, is on E and things. Uh, yes. That's great. That's great. So, And that I think the team felt the same, for sure. You didn't have any urge to say, okay, ladies, listen, uh, back to work, 7 a.m. practice tomorrow, or that just is a, oh. joke, a joke text just to see how that went over? Oh, they just, no. they <laughs> Nothing left. They They're were, done. They were dead. That's, yes. That's great. So um, you, you win the national championship. I wanted to hit on one other thing during the, the tournament. You know, I remember watching your your then assistant coach, uh, Coach Derek Radley, who is ne- who now is the, the uh, head coach at Oregon, um, walking mm-hmm. with, with Haley the, the pretty much the whole way on the back nine, if I remember correctly. What Mm -hmm. is it that a coach can do at that point? Because that's a pretty unique situation where you have a coach. You know, you don't see Nick Saban out there running the offense with his quarterback, but you're right there next to your player. 
What are the things that you're able to do as a coach during the tournament in that moment? Well, a glorified caddy, put it, put okay. it, put it in that, okay. like really, you know, Haley's very special and Haley, as you saw from the telecast gets very emotional out on the golf course. And as coaches, we've known that for the three years that we've had her. So, um, I was with Sandra up ahead, uh, finishing out that match. And so coach D was back with Haley and I, that's another thing that was so special about our coaching staff. We trusted one another. Uh, we knew each other. We're going to do the best for our players. So not one minute did I ever, you know, worry that Haley wasn't in good hands back with coach D cause he was the best. Right. And really just more so reminding them to deep breaths, uh, take a drink, take a drink of water, um, visualize the shot you want to see where like talk out shots, you know, everything that a caddy would do, talk about the yardages, like how far do you want to carry front number, pin, back number, ridge, every, all that kind of stuff. Just literally coach D was her caddy that couldn't push the bag. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, speaking of coach D now, this is a unique situation here. Um, I, I, you know, I follow professional sports. You, you rarely see like a, you know, a, a New York Yankee being traded to the Red Sox. You don't see normally like, uh, you know, a, a, a Jets pl- or a Giants player being traded to the Philadelphia Eagles. But you lost or your, your assistant coach, Coach D, goes basically in conference to mm-hmm. Oregon. Um, great for him. I'm sure you're thrilled. But are you thrilled that he's in or- at Oregon? Wouldn't it be better if he was over at a- Texas A&M or, or Georgia or something? I mean, you can't be thrilled about this, can you? You know, it's a situation where I, uh, of course, I, I would prefer if he's not in the Pac-12, but yeah. something you also might not know is Coach Derek got the Oregon job this summer, and then Coach Justin Silverstein, who was my assistant before Derek, got USC. So now I have what? two former assistants. Yeah, I have two former assistants that are head coaches uh, in the Pac-12. So it's, uh, it's but you know what? As a golf coach, you know, having an assistant coach is you, that's what you want for them. You want them of to get course. those big programs. And Coach D, actually, as not a lot of people know, he got offered the University of Texas San Antonio job the year before. So he could have jumped ship so easily a year before with me. But this is the type of guy that Coach D is. That he just loved working at University of Arizona. He loved our student athletes. And he knew we had something special at U of A. And I think he stuck it out one more year with me because he knew that he probably if we had another great year, he could probably get like a big time job, like yeah. a, a Virginia, Oregon, Wake Forest, those jobs that were open this summer. And he did just that. Well, good for him. But I, I'm going to have to ask him that question myself. Like, like, man, just staying within conference, just trying to really, I, I got, yeah, I'm going to have to talk to him about that. I'm going to have to see <laughs> that. I, yeah. I, I have a feeling he's using all of, uh, all of our same power PowerPoint presentations that we use to Arizona. He's, we probably are sending out the same mailers. I have no doubt that he's a, uh... yeah. Tell him to take the a off of his PowerPoints and replace it with a green O or that's a, that might be a little embarrassing. You know, I have uh, a feeling he's probably already done that. Okay. Yes. All right. Well, well, we'll make sure I'm sure he is. And I, I wish him luck as well. And, but, but I <laughs> just, saw, I saw that. And I was like, wow, that's uh that's interesting. Um, yeah. So you just got a, a five year extension at the university of Arizona. And you're going to be there, it looks like, till at the very least 2023. Mm -hmm. Coaching golf is a little bit different than other sports. You know, when you're a college football player, maybe you make a jump to the NFL. College basketball, you make a jump to the NBA. You know, there's really no jump on the coaching front that you can make from college golf. You've won a national championship. How do you keep yourself motivated personally with your career when you've kind of reached the top and the next, there isn't really a professional golf job waiting for you so like how do you how do you keep how do you keep your uh how do you keep motivated well it's um this this year so far also having a new assistant i have told a lot of people it feels like i'm a newly hired head coach okay and what what i mean by that is when you're a head coach that has not won a national championship your goal is is to win a national championship. And so all of a sudden, the moment you win a national championship, your next goal is to win another. So I've never, never had this role where I have a little bit more pressure on me um, to win it again. But that's the one thing that's so great about me having played at Arizona and now coaching at Arizona. Arizona is a very special place to me. And 
just being here and wanting to represent the U of A in the best way that I can, um, I'm just going to keep doing the very best that I can to recruit the best players, to keep winning championships, to keep being a, a power player in the Pac-12 and in the country. So it's, I think, you know, I, most most of us coaches are pretty competitive that we won't just lay down the guard and, and kind of give in now that we've won. I mean, my goals are just to keep thriving and we've got everyone back on the team that won last yeah, year. So. Yeah how great for those ladies to even have the opportunity to maybe win back to back. And so that's my responsibility to make sure that they are motivated and don't just be complacent with the fact that they've already won a championship and to keep them hungry and to beat Oregon. I mean, come on, that's, that's really what it comes down to. um, Well, if, uh, yes, exactly. No, I mean, I, I love Coach Derek. He was a brother to me and working together for six years, but I've got a, a new assistant, Justin Bubster, who's outstanding. And I look forward to building and making new memories with him as well. Absolutely. Well, we're going to, we're going to get you out of here. We have a, a section at the, uh, here at the back of the range called the quick bucket, really quick questions. I'm going to ask you one that I asked to coach Alan Brad in which I kind of, um, you need to put together a team of University of Arizona alums to go against the team that just won the national championship for you. You can play on that team, grab four other ladies. Who's on your dream team to go against uh, uh, Haley and Bianca and Gigi and the rest of the team? Oh, wow. Well, of course, Lorena Ochoa, yeah. Natalie Golbis, yeah. Annika Sorenstam, and then my very, very best friend here in Tucson, former teammate, also tour, former tour player, Christina yeah, Baena. Baena yeah. um, she probably thinks I should be putting her sister Marissa, but I love Christina too much. And so I think we would, uh, we would have the best time. So it'd be Annika, uh, Lorena, Natalie, Christina, and then of course myself, I got to play. And you're the anchor match, of course. (laughs) Um, so, uh, let me ask you this question. Uh, did you think, did you ever imagine that the national championship would get as big as it has since it went to match play? You know, before it went to match play, no, I never, never would have dreamed it would have gotten this big, but watching Stanford win that first year. And then after that, you know, I think the next year was it it was Washington and just the, and then ASU and then now us um, just seeing all the amazing things that is provided for those student athletes that have won a championship being televised. um, It's outstanding. It's so wonderful for women's and men's golf. It really is. Absolutely. Uh, Do you have a good waste management open story? (laughs) <laughs> oh probably back when i was 21 and in college and uh just i think that's when before they had the grandstands right. around the 70 t box so i can just remember standing around the t box probably throwing beer out on the t box when players come through but that's when i was 21 so you can't hold that against me i was young and stupid no, hey hey <laughs> co- coaches are people too it's fine it's fine <laughs> Um, let's see. Uh, no. What about uh, what about something that your team does that tries to keep you um, engaged with? Uh, you know, this you mentioned social media. You know, Snapchat and Instagram. It, I know they keep they keep us all young. These college players, but is there something that they're into that you're just like, yeah, I can't. That's just not me. I'm sorry. This is well. You, you uh, girls are crazy. I mean, I'm I'm 38 years old and I'm a mom of two small kids and I. I love country music. And so one thing that they try to keep me up to date is the hip hop and the rap music. And Gigi Stoll on our team is actually um, an aspiring rapper. And so uh, they just try to keep me, they try to keep me cool with whatever new hot Drake songs out, or I don't know. um, I don't know. I don't even know anybody. Cardi B. How's it working? I didn't even know who Cardi B. I didn't even know who Cardi B was until last year. I'm like, who's Cardi B? What's Cardi B? And so they they keep me plugged in with uh, hip new uh, music. I, I can't believe I said hip, but uh, they do they do their very best. And then the dance moves, whatever dance moves. Haley Moore likes to break it loose at practice, try not to injure herself. But uh-huh. they do. They they try to keep me cool. They try to nice. keep me cool. Yeah, and did Gigi shave her head? Hey, you know, she she just went with it. She wanted to change up her look, and she looks awesome. And, um, yeah, 
but hey, we're all we're an eclectic group at U of A. We got Hey, we got Bianca. I mean, Gigi the rapper. We we're an awesome group. Yu Sung Ho with the glasses, you know, and Sandra Nordos, our beautiful blonde from Norway. We were we're an awesome group. It's like a motley crew. I a, love it. It is a ben- it's a Benetton of golf dorks. That's it's, uh, <laughs> that is that is yes. that's awesome. Well. Um, Coach, this has been a lot of fun. I'm really glad we got to connect. Uh, I'm sure uh, the listeners will now be following um, uh, University of Arizona and make that make that quest to uh, to go back to back. I'm going to put a lot of your uh, Instagram and your your Twitter uh, handles in the show notes of the podcast. And I hope we can catch up again soon and we can talk about another national championship for you guys. Thanks, Ben. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about my program and how wonderful our student athletes are. And there you have it. Another great episode here at the back of the range. Thanks so much to coach Laura Ionello from Arizona. Wish her and her ladies a lot of success the rest of the year. As always, we will be back next week for another episode here at the back of the range.